Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today we have with us Mr. Sidney Sherwin. Sid is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. He is a retired captain, U.S. Navy. He was stationed in Pearl Harbor, was on deck of a ship when the attack took place. Uh, we are extremely fortunate uh, to have him come in and give us essentially a, an eyewitness account of the events at Pearl Harbor. I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Sherwin. Sit back here and... Can I move around? All right. And just to put us all up on the same scale, uh, I, I just want to say a word or two about why uh, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor in the first place and what the situation was like uh, in the time leading up to that. <coughs> in uh, early 1941, the Japanese and the United States uh, were on a collision course, really, for uh, commercial reasons, if you like. Uh, Japan had plans to move into greater Asia, to get out of her islands and spread out, because they needed, they felt, more territory, particularly they needed raw material. Among the most serious needs that they have was oil, and there was a lot of oil available in Southeast Asia. For reasons of diplomacy at that time and, and of our, the interest of our uh, uh, foreign relations. The United States stood in the way of this, and negotiations between the two companies, uh, between the two countries, to try to resolve all this trouble, went on for several months, and finally they broke down entirely. And as a result of that, Japan decided to make an attack, which they had had in the mills for some time. So in August of 1941, the Japanese task force uh, set forth from Japan up to the Kuril Kuril Islands, Kuril Islands, south of the Kamchatka Peninsula, and they went into training. They had a uh, they had a plan which they'd worked on for some time to knock the United States fleet out of action entirely in the Pacific which they felt would enable them then to perform the other parts of their program in, in moving into Asia, and that they would be moved into Asia, have the necessary oil that they needed, and be firmly ensconced there before the United States could strike back. Then it was their hope that the United States would accept uh, something already accomplished, a fait accompli, as the French say, and uh, that would be the end of it. So they had uh, ginned up a plan for an attack on Pearl Harbor. I'll give more details on that in a minute. But in late November of 1941, they got underway from the, Kuro, from the Kuril Islands under what we call radio silence. They didn't say anything. Nothing came up on the radio at all about where they were. Our people, our intelligence people, knew that the fleet was was at sea somewhere, but they didn't think they were coming to Pearl Harbor. There were lots of reasons why they might have gone down here to strike or in the Philippines to strike, but down in this area, uh, supporting Japanese landings seemed to make a lot more sense. At any rate, our intelligence people, for many, many reasons, and that's a big story and there's no room for it here, I uh, guess wrong. So the fleet got underway, the task force got underway, and it proceeded due east to roughly this point, and then southeast to a point here, about 200 miles north of the island of Oahu in the Hawaiian chain. And there they arrived early in the morning of December 7th, uh, 1941. They completed their attack, which took place in two waves, then they retired, this was their general path, more or less to the north, then due west, southwest of it, and then straight back to southern Japan, 
where they were welcomed as heroes. Now maybe we could have the uh, first projector slide. And perhaps it'd be better with the lights off. All right. This is a diagram of the island of Oahu, which is one of the principal islands of the, Hawa of the Hawaiian chain, as most of you perhaps know. And Pearl Harbor is located right in this area. And it's kind of a funny shaped thing. We'll get a little closer look at it in a minute on the next slide. Here is the city of Honolulu over here. Uh, the great uh, diamond head, uh, the uh, uh, big volcano crater is there, and so forth. And the Japanese came in in two waves. The first one, both of course coming from the north, and you remember where the task force was when they started. First wave came in here and split, and they were in different groups. There were fighters for, for fighter cover to protect the others, there were bombers, and there were torpedo planes. One group of them came over here and then swept on through the Koli Koli Pass and made around this way over toward Pearl Harbor. And uh, they came also over here to Wheeler Field, which was an Army Air Corps base. This was a predecessor to the U.S. Air Force, which wasn't formed until 1947. Dive bombers came down this way and the torpedo planes were all in here. This was the first wave. The second wave came in about an hour, hour and a half later, and they did pretty much the same thing except that they were farther to the west, uh, farther to the east. They hit uh, Pearl Harbor, but they also hit Wheeler Field again, and uh, they hit Kaneohe, which was a Marine Corps Naval Air Station, and uh, they also hit Bellows Field, which was another Army base, and of course in the, in the process of all this, they also landed on Hickam Field. Uh, they didn't land on it, but they sort of landed on it with both feet. Uh, dropped a lot of bombs on Hickam Field, which is quite close to Pearl Harbor. Now, let me I have the next slide, please. Here is a, 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 a close-up of the action area within Pearl Harbor itself. Uh, this is the channel going south from the island of Oahu down to the Pacific Ocean. And if you recall, these planes, many of these planes, came in from the northwest. Uh, and came, uh, some of them came way around here and came up this way. And the torpedo planes came over here. This is all water here, of course. The uh, uh, submarine base is over there, the supply center, and so forth. But this was, this area in particular, was sort of like a bowling alley. You could drop a torpedo in there, and it would run the whole distance. Uh, some of the others had to wait a little longer before dropping their fish, and they, they came over here. Now, let me go into a little bit as, as, the, as to what we had in the way of ships over here. This conglomerate here, uh, you have perhaps heard referred to as battleship roll. When we, the, our, our standard practice when we came in from sea, from exercises, was to come up the channel this way, go around Fort Island, where there was a small airstrip, go all the way around Fort Island, come around this way, and head out again as over, so that we're all ready to go out if we're going to see again in a hurry. The battleships uh, drew about 36 feet of water, and uh, there, wasn't, there weren't too many places where you could put them. So what they had done was to put in uh, pilings and concrete uh, mounds for moorings, and we would come in and tie up, each ship would tie up to a pair of these, and then another ship would tie up uh, outboard of the first ship. So here we had the, the Nevada, uh, the Arizona, uh, the Vestal, which was a, a mine craft, uh, the Tennessee, another battleship, West Virginia, another battleship, the Maryland, my ship, the Oklahoma, here was the Neosho, which is a, a, a fleet oiler, very fuel for the ships. And down here is the uh, California. This cluster of ships and things that you see down here uh, represent the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. And I had the uh, experience back in the 60s of, of uh, being stationed in that yard for four years, so I got quite familiar with it. 
Um, in the shipyard, there were a couple of ships undergoing repair. One of them was a Pennsylvania, which was the flagship of the Pacific Fleet. She was in dry dock. Uh, there were a couple of ships in there with her, and there was a ship over here in a floating, uh, sorry, in a marine railway. Take it again, a floating dry dock, doesn't really matter. The Casson and the Downs were, were in the dry dock here with the Pennsylvania. Anyway, the point is that there were a whole bunch of ships in there, and it was a nice, fat, juicy target uh, for the Japanese. Uh, they made a very brilliant tactical uh, attack. They accomplished everything that they set out to do, and they went home. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Okay, now so much for history lessons. I'm going to talk a little bit about personal experience. This was my ship, the Oklahoma, which I showed you on the on the uh, list there a minute ago. The Oklahoma was a 14-inch uh, uh, gun battleship. She had 10 14-inch guns. Uh, she displaced maybe 27,000 tons, and she was delivered to the fleet in 1916. Uh, these ships. Uh, this is of, of, of importance to my story. These ships had what we call a forecastle deck and a main deck. Now the main deck, by definition in, in the Navy, is, a, is a, the first deck, the uppermost deck, that runs the entire length of the ship. The forecastle deck just started up here and runs, of course, up to the bow. So that if you're standing back here and you need to go forward, you can go into a door here and run along this side and you go right around the turrets and all that sort of thing. Well, in, uh, uh, on December 7th, 1941, as it happened, I had the duty. And so I wasn't ashore. A lot of people were ashore that night. It was a regular liberty time. And uh, uh, many of them came back first thing in the morning and got a bad surprise when they did come back. Others came back a little later and there wasn't any ship for them. But I got up at the usual time and uh, as it happened, I had the, I had the deck watch from uh, quarter to eight, scheduled from quarter to eight to quarter to twelve. So I relieved the watch at, uh, at quarter to eight, and a few minutes after that, um, I noticed, and a lot of other people noticed, that there were a lot of airplanes flying around and diving on Port Island and other places. And our first reaction was what it usually was when we saw airplanes flying on Sunday. Those poor aviators didn't get to sleep in this morning, they're out practicing. Well, we were very speedily disabused of that because all of a sudden there was a lot of noise. There were bombs dropping on Hickam Field next door to us. There were bombs dropping on the seaplane hangar and ramps at uh, Fort Island. And uh, uh, it, it, it was very hectic indeed. So we sounded general quarters, and I proceeded forward. When I say proceeded, I mean hot. I was in a hurry. And I ran along here through this door, uh, through this, this door, underneath the forecastle deck to get toward my battle station. And as I did, there were a whole series, one right after another, of heavy explosions, which were obviously torpedoes. And the ship just bucked and, and shuddered. And uh, as nearly as I can determine, I, I was just running ahead of those explosions. Well, uh, by the time I got up to the turret forward, the ship was already listing badly. It was obvious that there, was, there wasn't going to be any uh, turret shooting that morning, not from our ship. So I went around to the other side, and uh, people had already closed up the watertight doors. So I found myself in a living compartment with about oh, 25 or 30 men and a couple of other officers. And uh, we're below decks. All the watertight doors are closed. The only exit is through a, a what we call an escape hatch, which is about this large, and it's an emergency door, which is in the middle of the regular hatch. You could just spin a wheel and open that up and, and go out through it. Problem is that you can't get a lot of people through a hatch like that in a hurry. So one of our people uh, got himself up through that hatch, grabbed a couple of sailors, got some wrenches on the main hatch and opened it up, and the rest of us got out. I was the last one out of the compartment. I went out on my hands and knees. And uh, when I got uh, up above, I was in what we call a gun casemate, uh, where the, <coughs> the uh, uh, smaller guns were located. The ship was still rolling, and I just went right on out into the fresh air and stayed on the, on the 
on the bottom of the ship as it gradually became the top. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? The other picture was before, this is after. This is the way she looked uh, when she finally stopped moving. Now, uh, a word of explanation on this. If you look at this, you'd think, well, this is the keel. This is not the keel. This is the bottom of the ship. This is the bottom of the ship. This is what we call a blister. These were, uh, this was, this was a, 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 a compartment which was designed to take the shock of, of torpedoes and that sort of thing. We took uh, somewhere between four and seven torpedoes, and I don't think they were ever quite sure because the damage was so bad. Well, anyway, I got out into the, into the open and uh, looked around, and the airplanes were flying overhead, and those people who had any aircraft guns they could use were using them. Uh, there was oil all over the place, and some of it was burning. Boats were running around picking people up. And let me tell you, it was a first-class mess. Now, I don't know what the average age is of this group, but I was 23 years old. Just put yourself in that position. It's a little hard to imagine, isn't it? Well, it was for me. Uh, so, uh, I decided that there wasn't a whole lot of point in my staying up there because there was still action going on. So I stripped down to my underwear and I put, put my shoes neatly, by, <laughs> took my hat off, my cap off, my white service, my white dress service uniform, my shoes, and I put my wallet and my watch and my Naval Academy ring in my shoes and then I went down one of the mooring lines. Remember, we were tied up outboard of the Maryland. Remember, I, I mentioned the Maryland and, and the Oklahoma was tied. So we took all the fish. They didn't take any. But when we rolled, the lines parted, these big, heavy mooring lines, and they just popped like so many rubber bands. And they were uh, lying over the side of the ship. So I just uh, let myself down into the water over, over uh, one of those, swam over to the Maryland, and people on board the Maryland Paul, me, and a couple of other sailors up on board, and we went down to the dispensary to wash the oil out of our eyes and out of our mouth. When I got down to the dispensary, I looked at the clock on the wall, and it said 8.15. That's exactly 17 minutes, which is probably less time than it's taken me to tell you about it. Uh, well, uh, that is essentially my story about Pearl Harbor, but there is a... Uh, there's a postscript that's kind of interesting. People ask me what happened in Oklahoma. I torpedoed your mic. The Oklahoma, uh, of course, was occupying very valuable real estate. And there weren't all that many places to put ships. So it was decided that the Oklahoma should be righted. So they undertook a salvage job by which they actually turned that ship right side up, and they held it in place by cables attached to the shore until they could make temporary repairs to her sides and pump her out. Then they took her over, put her in a dry dock, made more, slightly more, permanent repairs, and then they towed her over out of the way to another part of Pearl Harbor where she stayed for the rest of the war. At the end of the war, she was sold to a scrap dealer who took her under tow to San Francisco. And uh, the story was that he paid $40,000 for her and there was enough scrap in there to make that a very profitable venture indeed, if it had worked out. It didn't work out. They got underway with two tugs towing her and uh, a couple days out of Pearl Harbor, traveling very slowly of course, they ran into a storm and she began to leak. The next day, sorry, the next night, the next night the captain of one of the tugs was wakened by his mate, who was the only other crewman he had aboard this tug. And he said, Captain, we're going backwards. And what had happened was that the Oklahoma was going down and she was drawing that big powerful truck, uh, uh, tug back with her as she went. So of course the captain jumped up and the mate went and they got a sledge and they, they uh, hit what we call pelican hook, which turned all their gear loose. They lost all the towing gear and everything, and the Oklahoma went to the bottom in a thousand fathoms, which is about 6,000 feet, and nobody's bothered to look for her yet. And if they did, I don't know what they'd do with her, because 
she's at least as badly off as the as the Titanic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my story, and uh, I'll be very happy to entertain any questions. Uh, Sid, when you talked to the Lions Club, you were talking about being on the deck with uh, one of the Japanese pilots flying over, looking out. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, just before I started forward to go under the forecastle deck, uh, a Japanese plane flew overhead, and he was just, he just barely cleared the mast. Uh, there were two people in the plane, and the, uh, the canopy was drawn back, and there was grease on the cowling from the engine. I could see all this. It was very clear. I could see it clearly now as I could see it then. Two people, the pilot and his co-pilot or his bombardier or his torpedo man or whoever it was, looking out over the side of us. Very obviously, these people had just dropped a torpedo that had our name on it. That was no doubt one of the bangs I heard a few seconds later. I have uh, I, I've had the experience since of talking to a Japanese pilot who was one of those who, who took part in the action that morning. The time I talked to him was 25 years ago, perhaps. He was practicing medicine down in uh, Honolulu. I don't think I've stirred your audience very much, Paul. Well, I've got some. Go ahead. What did you do after Pearl Harbor? Did you, what was your? Well, uh, I left my ship, went over to the Maryland, uh, spent most of the morning, spent the whole morning on the Maryland, then went over to Fort Island, and I spent, I mean, we were tied up there at Fort Island. Uh, I spent the rest of the day and that night there, and I was sleeping on a table when the, a flight of planes, of our planes, came in from the Enterprise, which was a carrier that had been outside. And our aircraft, our anti-aircraft opened up on them and shot a couple of them down. Well, the following day, then, I went over to the sub-base. Everything was pretty well screwed up. You know, there weren't any records, there wasn't any pay, there wasn't any uniforms, there were no uniforms. Uh, there wasn't any organization, really. I mean, we were really messed up. And in the Navy, you depend on organization. I mean, everybody depends on organization. Uh, but eventually, I got assigned, oh, well, within a day or so, I got assigned to the uh, section base, which was down the channel. Remember I pointed out where the channel was. The section base, uh, the principal function of the section base was to handle nets to make sure that no, no uh, submarines slipped into harbor, that sort of thing. And I was down there, and pretty dull it was, too, until about the 1st of March. And uh, then I, I got ordered back to put a new ship in commission, another battleship. And I stayed with that ship until uh, I joined her on the East Coast. I went around the West Coast in November of 42, and I was with her until December of 43. And I came back again, put an aircraft in carrier in commission. I was gunnery officer of the air aircraft carrier until July of 45. Then I came back and went to postgraduate school in electronics engineering. And uh, essentially, I worked in shipyards and in the electronics end of ship design for the rest of my career, which was until 1969. That's quick and dirty. What were the names of the battleship and the aircraft carrier that you were assigned to? The battleship was the Indiana, DV-58. <coughs> she was scrapped a long time ago. Uh, the carrier was the Hancock. The carrier had uh, had much more of a, a life. She stayed on. She wasn't scrapped until, uh, I guess, maybe the 70s. She was converted a number of times. Uh, she was the first carrier that we had. Now, of course, this is all after I left her. But she was the first carrier that uh, that we had that had the, the angled deck. Do you know about the angled deck? Mm -hmm. Does everybody know about the angled deck? It used to be if you were going to land an airplane aboard a carrier, you had to come right down the center line. And uh, there was a fellow named the, uh, the uh, uh, landing landing signal officer, the LSO, 
whose job it was to tell you to land or to wave you off so you wouldn't land. If anything went wrong between him and you or just you, then there was a, a big barrier down there made up of, of wire and cables and things to stop you from piling into things up forward. If you went over that, uh, then you pile into a bunch of airplanes. That happened once when I was there. and There were 19 people killed. Uh, so it was a dangerous business. Uh, at the end of the war, the British uh, came up with a, with a simple idea of having planes land not along the center line of the flight deck, but off, I'll set something like five degrees, not very much, but enough so that if anything went wrong, you had a chance to go around again. And that had a dramatic effect on flight, on carrier uh, safety. The Hancock was the first U.S. ship to have that. Uh, the other thing we had that we were the first U.S. ship to have, and again it was a British invention, uh, was steam catapults. When I was aboard the uh, Hancock, we had compressed air uh, hydraulic catapults, and every time you fired an airplane off, you had to wait until your accumulators were charged up again so that you have enough pressure to drive the next plane off. And they would just catapult the first few planes uh, because there wasn't, there wasn't enough room ahead of them all for them to fly off under their own power. So they'd, they'd catapult the first few, then they'd fly the rest off under their own power. Uh, when the jets came along, there were problems with that. In the first place, the, the jets need a lot more room to take off than propeller-driven planes do. Uh, and so they, they uh, uh, somebody got in the British side got the bright idea that Maybe if we used steam catapults, we could hook them up to the boiler, and there'd always be plenty of steam, because they'd make a lot of steam. So they did that, and we converted, and all our carriers now use steam catapults, and they don't fly off anymore. They're all catapulted. It's much quicker, and uh, it wouldn't be feasible to fly the jets off under their own power, except maybe from way aft in a very high wind, high speed. Any other questions? Sir? After the second wave of attack, um, were you in, your, in the people in the service, or the people around Fort Allen, were you suspecting a third wave, or was that your...? Well, of course, we didn't know what to expect. Yeah. And uh, what happens in a situation like this is that rumors fly right and left. There are all sorts of rumors about the Japanese landing on the other side of the island, you know. Uh, so, no, we didn't, we didn't know what to expect. Uh, there's a historical note on that. The, uh, the leaders, the, the actual leaders of the Japanese flight, uh, flew back to their carrier, and they said to their admiral, there's stuff we've missed. Notably, we haven't touched all their fuel oil. Their fuel oil is sitting all out there. We've done what we went to do, but those targets are just there for the taking. And the admiral said, no, he was cautious. He said, no, we've done what we came to do, and he took them out of there, as a result of which our fuel oil supply for the whole Pacific fleet was untouched. And that was a big mistake. And the other big mistake, of course, they made was a strategic one rather than a tactical one. Do you all know the difference between strategy and tactics? Well, let me assume that you don't, let me tell you. Tactics uh, involve what's going on in any particular action, in any immediate field. The Battle of Bulge is a tactical situation. The attack on Pearl Harbor is a tactical situation. You get the general idea. Strategy is the big picture. You know, what happens uh, when we go into Europe? Or, or are we going? Are we going to land on the coast of Normandy? Or are we going to come up through the Mediterranean? <coughs> Those are strategic matters. You get the general idea. Okay. The attack on Pearl Harbor was a brilliant tactical success, and it doesn't take anything away from those people to say that strategically it was a blunder. And it was a blunder because it united the United States in a way that I, I can't imagine anything else could have done. There were people in those days, uh, there are, are, are always people who hate war so much that they'll do anything to stay out of it. The people talking about America first, let's not get entangled in other uh, countries, in uh, other countries situations and so forth. And those people were so strong in the uh, summer of 1941 that uh, it would have been extremely difficult 
for any president to take us into war without uh, without a, a major change there. And if you want to look for an example of what happens when you go to war without public support, just look at Vietnam. So anyway, what the Japanese did was to unite American public opinion. And what that meant was uniting American industrial might, bringing the whole works in behind uh, not only against the Japanese, but because Hitler declared, on, declared war on us within the, the next couple of days, bringing us uh, into the battle with Great Britain against uh, Germany and the European powers. There's some stories that say that, that uh, maybe that, who was it, FDR was the president at that time? Mm -hmm. FDR knew, didn't exactly know about the attack, but you know, at the same time, knew that if it did happen, what the circumstances would be, it would unite the country and therefore propel us into the war. So in that, in that fashion, are there stories that people think that maybe he might have known about it? Well, of course there are stories. There have been a lot of books written about uh, Pearl Harbor, and there, there are a few of them that, that, uh, that push that point of view. I don't happen to agree with it. If, you, uh, if you're interested in this sort of thing at all, a book I can recommend to you is one called And I Was There. It was written by, uh, well, when he, when he wrote the book, he was a uh, retired rear admiral. But he was the intelligence officer for Admiral Kimmel, who was in charge of the naval forces at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. But Leighton, after Kimmel was relieved, Leighton stayed on as Admiral Nimitz's intelligence officer, and he was with him all through the war. And he was intimately familiar with all of the information, the intelligence that was received, the dispatches that went back and forth between the Navy in Washington and the Navy at Pearl Harbor. And he says, uh, flatly really, that this was not the problem. The problem was a communications problem, and as far as the Navy was concerned, it was a problem within the Navy itself. There were two groups which were sort of fighting each other for, for territory, for turf, which is a, that's always a, that's always a hazard. The people specifically were the intelligence people and the communications people. And according to Leighton, the upshot of this was that there was information in Washington that was not sent from Washington out to Pearl Harbor. The, uh, everybody knows that, that the uh, Japanese codes uh, had been broken and they were being read regularly. But an awful lot of the Japanese information was being read not at Pearl Harbor, but in Washington, and Washington apparently wasn't sending it all on. That's Layton's version, and I happen to agree with it. I haven't seen anything else quite as convincing, because he was right there. And it's not as though he lost his job when Kimmel did. He stayed on and had the full support of the, the fellow who turned out to be a winner. Anything else? What was your rank when the attack happened? I know you they said you're a retired you're a retired captain. But at the time of the I was an ensign. I was a year and a half out of the Naval Academy. I been the Oklahoma was my first ship. <coughs> I had uh, joined her in uh, Bremerton, Washington in the summer of nineteen forty and uh, I'd been her, been aboard her for about a year and a half. I had uh, I had a year and a half's experience as a junior officer. I was a qualified deck watch stander, I was a turret officer and uh, done some other things. But I was a very junior officer. So I, I want to make it clear, this whole thing was not my fault. <laughs> Sid, uh, you talked about, as you could, we could see from the uh, pictures, how the ship rolled. You were telling us, you spoke to the Lions Club about people being caught below decks. I would like yeah. to have you recount that story here. Well, sort of a little grisly, but. Yeah, while well, she rolled, I was it, it, it seemed at the time as though she was taking forever, but a lot of people didn't have the, weren't as lucky as I was. I got out, even though on my hands and knees, but a lot of people that didn't get out. And probably most of the people that died just suffocated underneath. And uh, after the ship had, uh, had capsized, the people in the shipyard, uh, whose job it is to do ship fitting and all that sort of thing, came over there as fast as they could in boats and they started cutting into the hull. They'd listen to where they'd hear some tapping, and then they would, they would cut a hole. And they got several people out. They did, this, um, they did this for about 36 hours, 
after which they heard no more tapping, and that was the end of it. There's been a book recently written by one of the survivors who got out, and uh, I haven't read the book, but I gather that it's a very, and you can imagine, it's a very hair-raising tale about being there in the dark, uh, hearing nothing but an occasional tap, watching the water, not watching, but feeling <coughs> the water rising slowly, and then hearing the people outside and tapping and having them cut you out. Bad experience. You were saying something, how long did some of that tapping go on? About 36 hours. I think that I wouldn't want to be held to the precise number, but about 36 hours and about 30, 30 to 35 people, I think they rescued. More than your pleasant way to die. No. No, well, I'm not sure there is a pleasant way to die. <laughs> Anything else? Are keeping anybody from the class? No, no. In fact, uh, we're sitting in pretty good shape time-wise. Come on, people, you have to... You have a unique experience here. Do you not participate in any other major battles in the Pacific? Well, uh, the Indiana didn't see a whole lot of action when I was a boarder. I say I left her in December of 43. Uh, but the Hancock was a little different. Uh, we went out there in October 44, which was after the first battle of the Philippine Sea and the, the uh, Marianas Turkey shoot and all that. But we saw a lot of action. Uh, I mean, we saw all the action I care anything about. Uh, the, uh, the, the kamikazes, we went through the kamikaze bit. Uh, we had a couple of hits, and we had some uh, we did a fair amount of shooting ourselves, but in, a, in a, uh, an aircraft carrier, uh, your first protection, not only for the carrier, but for the ships that are protecting the carrier, is what we call a CAP, the Combat Air, Air Patrol, your own airplanes. And those fighters are up there looking around all the time, and the, the uh, radars are going round and round uh, trying to pick up the, the enemy coming in. And those of us who had the anti-aircraft job in the, in the, uh, in the gun batteries, uh, didn't get into the action unless the combat air patrol were unsuccessful. Most of the time they were successful. They were awful good at shooting down incoming planes. But once in a while, they, uh, the, the planes would get through, and then it'd be up to us. Of course, all the time this is going on, we're looking. We're getting information over the, over the circuits uh, over the radio circuits uh, as to what the, what the uh, uh, radar information is, uh, whether the planes are coming in and whether they're coming in directed at us, and if they are, how far away they are, and so forth. Then, we, of course, we get the word when our own planes were called off to give us a chance to use the guns. And that's kind of an unpleasant experience just because you're just sitting there with, you know, we're not all that old ourselves. We're pretty old, pretty young, and, and uh, it, you can feel your tummy clutching up until uh, until the first one comes inside and you you open fire and uh, and then you're too busy doing that to worry about it anymore. But we uh, we were involved in uh, in Lady Gulf. We were involved in the support for uh, Iwo Jima. Uh, in the Indiana, we did one shore, shore bombardment of the island of Nauru. We did a lot of general cruising. Somebody said. Uh, War is uh, a lot of days and weeks of sheer boredom punctuate, punctuated by a few seconds of sheer terror. If you're lucky, you don't have any of those. You just get bored. Anybody else? After, uh, after seeing the, like the, the minutes after the, the second wave hit, you know, and you see that some of your comrades and your friends and stuff obviously lost their lives in it. Did you develop a, did you like on the spot develop a sort of hatred or, or a revenge inside that, to want to, you know, get into action and actually to, you know, kind of like a payback? Yeah, I guess there'd be some of that. But uh, it didn't happen just like that. See, when, uh, when I left the Oklahoma, I didn't have any idea. I mean, when I actually left the ship and went over to Maryland, I didn't have any idea who'd made it and who hadn't made it, you see. And it was only as the day went on, you know, we'd look around and say, oh, here's Charlie, and then we'd throw our arms around Charlie, and 
and you'd say, well, where, where's Frank? And Frank didn't show up. And uh, so this all gradually sank in on us. And uh, I, I guess what I'm saying is that the thing was so much bigger an experience than any of us had had that we were more numb than anything else. I think this, this, uh, this <coughs> anger and fury and so forth that struck the general American public right away, I think came on, speaking just for myself, came on me a little more slowly. I don't say it didn't come. And I don't feel that way about the Japanese now. I uh, you know it's 50 years ago and, uh, and life has to go on. And my feeling about the... Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day who said, uh, oh, he'd been reading a book, a uh, report of a Lieutenant Goto who had been flying over Pearl Harbor on that day, and he looked out of his airplane and looked down there at his ship, see, and uh, he said, Lord, that so certainly sounds like the one I looked up at from a ship. And this fellow said, well, would you, uh, would you be interested in talking to Lieutenant Goto? And I said, well, of course I would. And he said, well, you mean you don't hate him? And I said, no, I don't. Uh, he was just doing his job the way I hope I'd have done mine if somebody told me to. And 50 years is a long time, and, uh, you know, old warriors uh, sometimes have a lot to talk about. They, uh, after uh, the turn of the century, and you probably never heard this story, but after the turn of the century, they had a reunion in Gettysburg of the Union forces who fought there and the uh, Confederate forces who fought there. They reenacted the battle. And the, uh, the, these old battered rebel veterans came up that hill and these uh, old battered federal veterans fired blanks at them. And then they all ran out and they met in the middle of the field and threw their arms around each other and cried. You know, it's human nature. Any more? On your return trip, uh, Sid, last November, can you tell us what, what happened? Oh, sure. Well, I had a call from uh, I had a call from Channel 7 in uh, Buffalo, and they, uh, they asked if, uh, if I would go out to Pearl Harbor with them uh, before the anniversary because they wanted to do a, a documentary. I said, oh, how did you happen to get me? And they said, well, we found somebody who was a member of the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association, and he gave us the names of six people in this area. And he said, uh, we looked up, uh, he said, you're the sixth one we call, the other five are dead. So I said, sure, I'll go with you. And uh, we went out to Pearl Harbor back in November, and we went over all this old ground. We went over Hickam Field and Wheeler Field, and of course we spent a lot of time at, at uh, Pearl Harbor, and we went up to the Punch Bowl. The Punch Bowl is where the uh, Pacific uh, Military Cemetery is. We went up there and uh, looked up, uh, uh, tried to look up the graves of some of my friends from the Oklahoma. We actually found one. But we also found, I found to my surprise, that there are several hundred graves up there marked uh, unknown, USS Oklahoma. And of course, by the time they got the Oklahoma right side up, they couldn't identify most of these people. But there was one whom they could identify by name, and he has a gravestone with his name on it, and we found it. So that was kind of interesting to me. I had a very pleasant week. Anything else? Were you there the actual reunion? No, I was not. I was not. We came back came back on the 19th of November, so it's pretty close. How, you said you talked to a Japanese officer, whatever, pilot. How many have you talked to? Is that the only one you talked to, or have you talked to more than that? It's the only one I, it's the only one I know of. I, I think there's only one. Did he have any ill feelings toward you? He didn't mention it. It was a cocktail party, and he would have been would have been rude of him to mention it. <laughs> he spoke English? Oh, yes. Well? Very well. You know, when, when uh, I want to start rambling here in a minute, you better shut me off, but when I was a boy, uh, <laughs> There were all sorts of examples around of shoddy, sloppy workmanship on the part of the Japanese. And I think uh, we all sort of thought that, that, 
that they just couldn't do a thing like this. This was a brilliant, brilliant exercise. Beautifully uh, uh, conceived, beautifully executed. Uh, with a minimum of casualties, they lost very few airplanes. Uh, and, you know, it was better than anything we could have done at the time. Before the war was over, we were doing a lot better than they were. But it was a real eye-opener. And uh, when you see what the Japanese are doing now in the automobile business, uh, it just goes to show you can't trust anybody to be stupid. Basically, every Yamamoto was uh, like the head guy behind the whole deal with the Japanese and stuff. Um, they said that he was also forced to do it by the Japanese emperor or whatever, and uh, he, he didn't really want to. What do you think of him as a, you know? Well, of course, I never knew him about Yamamoto, well, but everything I've read about him leads me to great admiration for him. Admiral Yamamoto had spent several years in the United States. He'd been to MIT and he'd uh, been in Washington and played poker with a lot of Americans. And he knew America probably better than any other Japanese in any position of strength. And when, they, when the Japanese found themselves with this problem of the United States standing between them and their plan for conquest of Asia, and uh, uh, said, well, why don't we knock out their fleet? Yamamoto said, if you do that, you're going to have to fight the battle all the way across the continent to Washington, D.C., and dictate the peace on the White House lawn. He was against it. And they, but he wasn't the deciding voice. The Army had the deciding voice. And uh, uh, so they, uh, they gave him the job of planning the attack, which he did. You're quite right about that. And, uh, 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 his remark about the White House lawn was twisted by our propagandists into a threat. Yamamoto says they're going to do less than so and dictate the peace on the White House lawn. You have to look at these things in context. Do you know the story of what happened to Yamamoto? Yeah, the New Guinea. He got shot down on the plane over New Guinea. That's right. Yeah. That's right. They had that. Do you all know that story? Well, this again, this is part of the business of, uh, of having broken the Japanese code. Yamamoto was a very precise man when he said the wheels were to be down at such and such a time, well, the wheels had better be down at such and such a time. The Japanese made the mistake of sending out his schedule for the inspection of a base in, uh, in, <coughs> in New Guinea, uh, and he was supposed to be wheels down at 7.30 in the morning. The, uh, our intelligence people took this thing to Nimitz and said, look, we can take this man out, but you've got to make the decision. And Nimitz, uh, thought long and hard about it and finally decided that this was the proper thing to do because Yamamoto was not only a very fine officer and a very great leader, but also he was a he was a uh, sort of a father figure, really. Well, maybe that's a little strong, but he was a, a, a figure that they really looked up to, the Japanese looked up to. So anyway, they decided to do this, and they sent out a flight of something like 28 B, uh, uh, P-38s, which was a twin-engine fighter, and they arrived... Uh, they went, out, they, they went out there at about 200 feet, just above the water, to avoid being picked up by radar. And a few miles out, they, they just turned, went upstairs to about 20,000 feet, and they looked down, and here's Yamamoto's airplane and, and fighter escort and all the rest of them. They wiped out most of them. Again, we lost a couple of planes. The Yamamoto was later found dead in his plane, and, uh, and uh, our people said nothing at all about it because they didn't want anybody in Japan to be thinking about this business of having had their coats broken. So the Japanese uh, uh, treated it apparently as an accident. That was reenacted on television a few years ago. You know, it's a, there are a lot of stories. I think that's, I, I think that's probably enough, don't you? Oh, we're just about right on time here. Thank you very much, Sid. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Uh, some interesting stories. And as I said to the class, that uh, it's not often that you can get someone who has been in those kind of battles to come in and talk about it. And as you pointed out, when Channel 7 called and talked to six people and said, you're the last of them, uh, you know, the other five are dead. 50 years ago, 
uh, you know, you people are going to be one of the last groups probably to hear these kind of stories from someone who has been there. Well, there's been a lot written down. Oh, there's been a lot written down, very definitely, but uh, when you hear it from someone who's lived through it, it adds a, an extra dimension that you could not get from the written word. I thank you again. Very tired of us. We'll see you people Monday. Back.